Good morning again, and welcome back. Uh, we're very pleased and honored this morning to have uh, Susan Forsberg presenting on the history of San Diego, and specifically the history of St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, Susan, as, as many of you know, is a professor of biological sciences at uh, USC, uh, and we're very honored to have her here to talk, tell us about what should be a very interesting uh, story of our past. Um, this presentation was originally given at the uh, 2023 Vergers Guild Annual Conference, and it was very popularly received. Um, we're promised some scandals, uh, something about a shipwreck, and of course a better understanding of our present by looking at our past. So um, with that, I will, Susan, take it away. Thanks, Sterling. So I'm pleased to give this. Um, you know, I am not an expert in history. I'm just a history buff. And the origins of this were when Lisa was putting together the Rogers Conference, she felt the need for um, uh, an additional workshop. And I said, well, most of these folks aren't from California. Let's tell them about California history and, and, and you know, how we ended up getting here um, as a cathedral. And uh, it was well received. Um, and so I was asked to give it again. And I want to acknowledge that I couldn't have done the Episcopal part of it without John Will's help. John is our cathedral and diocesan archivist. And, um, a wealth of knowledge about, about that stuff. Um, and, um, you know, as I said, um, I've done my best to make sure that I'm accurate, but um, I'm not an expert in history. But let's get started. So when people talk about the history of San Diego, they often talk about how Cabrillo discovered San Diego. And of course, we've got a whole national monument across in Point Loma with a big statue there uh, looking across um, to the city. But of course, Cabrillo didn't discover anything because there were lots of people living in California when um, Cabrillo showed up. And um, this map is very striking because it shows the, uh, the indigenous tribes of California um, in the pre-contact era. And one of the really interesting things about um, California's tribes is that they're culturally and linguistically very distinct from one another. Um, uh, if you look at language, I'm interested in language, and if you look at how the languages trace to different uh, areas, they actually have a number of different roots. So these are very distinct um, populations and cultures, and unfortunately, um, a number of them are gone now entirely, and we'll talk a little bit about how that um, tragedy happened. Um, in our own community, the Kumeyaay people, um, and I think typical of a lot of the uh, 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 tribal communities on the west side of the Sierras, um, people were seasonal and moved from the sea to the mountains to the desert with the seasons. And um, this is just a few of my photographs showing, um, you know, in Mount Laguna, um, there are uh, signs even now of, of uh, people doing that, the morteros, you know, the grinding stones in the, uh, or the grinding holes in the stones. And you can look down into the desert from Koimei Point in Mount Laguna and think about what it was like for folks to go down there for the winter. Um, there's a Mortero site in the desert where the Mortero um, grinding holes are, are like almost 10 inches deep. And you just think about how many generations of people um, returned to that site to do that. There's also pictographs throughout the desert um, uh, indicating you know, places where uh, people, uh, people migrated. So um, quite a lot of culture, of that culture, um, is still uh, found um, remotely. But of course, we talk about Cabrillo because Cabrillo in 1542 was uh, sent by the King of Spain to essentially claim Alta California um, for the Spanish crown. And so he set sail um, up, uh, up the coast of California. He didn't do a terribly detailed mapping job, but he was the first European to set step foot ashore. Uh, the Maritime Museum now has a reproduction of his ship, the San Salvador, and that's the reproduction in the, in the top right. And so you can go see uh, a reproduction of that. They do take her out to sea, too, which is pretty cool. Um, he went all the way up uh, just north of San Francisco Bay. He did not enter San Francisco Bay. It turns out from a sailing ship, if you look into the bay, Alcatraz looks like a plug, and nobody realized there was a bay there. So he sailed past it and came back down, got off on one of the Channel Islands, broke his leg, and died. Um, but that was, uh, so 1542 Cabrillo um, basically is planting the flag for Spain. Now there were lots of explorers pushing around California in that era. Of course the British were, uh, were great seafarers and in 1579 Sir Francis Drake um, came ashore and is reputed to have come ashore north of Marin County in what is called Drake's Bay. And this is the reproduction of his ship, the Golden Hind, which is in London. Um, and so he is thought to have made, um, uh, also made contact with uh, Northern California um, tribal communities 
And um, kind of well, the first of our, one of our fun stories is Drake recorded that he had created um, a brass tablet uh, with some record of the journey. And in the 1930s, a brass tablet was found near Drake's Bay. And um, a UC Berkeley professor said, I've been looking for this for years, and immediately uh, said that this was the real thing. Well, turns out that in the 1970s, they finally did some uh, metallurgical analysis on this, and it was a forgery. It had been put together in the 1930s specifically to spoof that Berkeley professor, and it got so out of hand that nobody really would quite admit it, but they now know that it was done as part of a kind of archaeological spoof. Um, what's also now known is that Drake he probably didn't get to Drake's Bay. He probably didn't get further south of the Oregon border. But you know, the stories that we tell are not always true. Um, Spain, you know, so 1542, six, 60 years later, um, uh, uh, Vizcano was sent to actually do some mapping. And this is the guy who gave us our name of San Diego. He named San Diego after his ship. And he sailed a more detailed mapping expedition up the Baja and Alta California coast. He identified Monterey as a great natural bay, and that actually would become uh, one of the capitals of California. Again, did not go into San Francisco Bay, didn't look like a bay from the sea. That Alcatraz plug was still intact. So he, was, uh, so he managed to get um, uh, a, a more detailed mapping issue. So the king was becoming a little concerned because, you know, again, the British had poked in. The Russians were a real problem. They were coming down um, from, uh, uh, from Siberia and down from Alaska. Um, and indeed, we have Fort Ross near Mendocino is a rush, site of a Russian fort. So uh, as, um, as uh, sailing uh, ships became more developed and, of course, people were uh, exploring more, um, uh, the king of Spain was becoming more and more concerned about this. But even so, it took from 1602, it took over another hundred years for serious efforts for, the Spain, for, New, for Spain to colonize New Spain um, to occur. And so in 1769, there were twin expeditions, one by sea, by Pe Pedro Fajes, and one by land um, with Gaspar de Portola, and they planned to converge in San Diego. And so they came to San Diego and established a garrison at an old Kumeyaay um, village called Koseyaay, and the image on the top right is a photograph taken in the 1930s of a reproduction of what they thought that original um, village looked like. The Spanish uh, soldiers were called, were called leather jackets because they wore these two big uh, heavy leather tunics. And, um, and so they were settling themselves uh, and establishing the first garrison in San Diego. Um, now, de Portola had somebody with him, um, Father Junipero Serra, a Franciscan friar. The king of Spain had successfully used the idea of, of missions to colonize Mexico. And so uh, a series of missions had been planted across Mexico um, to, uh, again, with garrisons and establishing um, colonialism. But the king became distressed because those missions had been established by Jesuits. And you know you can't control a Jesuit. So he decided that he was going to kick the Jesuits out of this new project and put it in the hands of the Franciscans. And so uh, Father Junipero Serra was the Franciscan chosen. And the first of uh, 21 missions in Alta California was established here in San Diego, the uh, Mission de Alcala. Um, and so this map just kind of shows you all the way from San Diego, the northernmost mission is up there in Sonoma. Each mission would be established about a day's ride apart. Um, it is said that the reason we have so much mustard in our hills in this time of year is that the friars were throwing mustard seeds out of their pockets to mark El Camino Real as they rode it. Um, by the way, the mustard is not native here and it's considered an extremely invasive plant. Um, anyway, so, you know, I grew up Roman Catholic, and you know, this is the, sto the, the, the sweet story that we learned uh, in Catholic school when I was a child, but um, we now know that the reality was a little different. The missions were actually um, a point of enslavement. They uh, used the garrison soldiers to help them round up um, indigenous uh, people and basically use them as free labor for the great agricultural expanse that they were creating. Um, as you can see here, I mean, we've, the number of new books have come out in the last 20 years. Um, nearly half the mission population of Indians died every year. There were uh, rebellions and attempts to rebel. Uh, the San Diego uh, Mission Indians attempted to rebel and were, you know, sort of brutally suppressed. And when uh, when more um, uh, uh, 
Spanish um, colonizers came in, they would find that the missions were basically functioning as a huge agribusiness running on free labor. So it was very difficult um, for, uh, for folks outside the mission to get started. So I think we're only really um, truly coming to grips with this. And this means that um, Unipro Serra has uh, lost a lot of that uh, romance. There's still a, a statue of him in Statuary Hall in uh, the capital in DC, but there's movements asking that that statue be removed because this is not a history um, of which we should be particularly proud. So again, the king wanted to get more people, more Spanish people in there, so um, an effort was made to find another route in, a land route, and that was uh, done by, uh, in 1774, the first expedition by Juan Batista de Anza. And there is actually, uh, the National Park Service doesn't just have national parks and monuments, it actually also has national historic trails. And there's a 1,200 mile national historic trail for uh, marking De Anza's expedition, um, which uh, came up um, from Mexico into, uh, 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 and along the desert and then up into uh, what we now think of as Borrego Springs and Anza Borrego Desert State Park. They walked up Coyote Canyon. This is a view up Coyote Canyon um, in the springtime. A um, little aside there, um, there was a big effort in the 1960s to build a freeway through there, which fortunately was, uh, was quashed. Um, so De Anza made it all the way up to San Francisco. Oh, guess what? There's a bay here. <laughs> so in 1776, they actually planted a, a little a settlement called Yerba Buena. Um, it would become San Francisco uh, some years later. Uh, in se uh, so the first of uh, De Anza expedition, he sort of marked this trail, came back down, and then did another expedition, now bringing in women and um, settlers and livestock. Again, they had a hard crossing of the desert before they made it to a, um, the, uh, the first of the, the springs around um, Borrego Springs. There's an historical monument in Coyote Canyon for the Santa Catarina Spring, where they camped for a while. And apparently, if you go far enough the, up the canyon, there is something called the First Child Monument, because on Christmas Eve in 1775, the first European child was born there um, in California. So the First Child Monument, you know, it's a, really? I think there have been a lot of children born here before that. So in any event, so that, uh, that got um, a route coming in through, uh, on the land side um, through, um, through Mexico and um, settlement starting. Now let's just think, 1776, what else is happening in 1776, right? So we grow up learning American history. We don't, we don't think about that California was just being um, colonized at the time that you know, we're signing the Declaration of Independence. Um, so when, when I presented this to the Berger's Conference, people were like, I had no idea. All right, so um, Mexico gets uh, uh, fights for its independence and it becomes independent from Spain in um, about 1821. And they secularized the missions. So they kicked out the Catholic Church, put soldiers into the missions. Many of them fell into disrepair. And um, they decided that the way they would do things is that they would establish large land grants called ranchos. And um, folks who had been um, supporters of uh, Mexican independence or were otherwise notable would be given these large land grants. So you would have, you know, Rancho Penasquitos and Rancho Bernardo are all marking um, places where these ranchos occurred. Um, the um, indigenous um, peoples managed to get away from much of their slavery, and um, there were certainly um, um, pushback against the ranchos. Um, so you can see this map I found that uh, around this period of time, the Kumeyaay were um, uh, able to uh, mount some um, attacks back, trying to um, uh, regain some of their land, and unfortunately, of course, we know that wasn't successful. You can see in 1834, the Presidio of uh, San Diego was described as in a most ruinous state, apart from one side where the commandant lived with his family, only two guns, and 12 half-clothed and half-starved looking fellows. Um, the population of San Diego was declining, um, down to just 150 um, Californios by, uh, uh, by 1838. So, uh, so the uh, Mexican um, community who lived in California thought of themselves as Californios. Mexico had a lot of problems to deal with down south, so there was not a lot of activity paying attention, and they were very, really very independent. The business of the Californios, I was talking to uh, Mike Thornburg yesterday about this, the business of the Californios was the California banknote, and the California banknote was tanned cowhides. 
So the whole area was cattle ranching, and they would cat. They took the cow hides and would tan them, and then big um, um, bales of them would be put on um, ships to be taken back to the East Coast. So California was the main source of cow leather. And so they would actually throw these things here in Southern California, they'd throw them over the cliffs and they'd be carried out to the boats. And you may have heard, if you're a Californian, of a book called Two Years Before the Rat Mast, written in 1840 by Richard Henry Dana, for whom Dana Point is named. And that describes his experience as being on one of these ships, collecting these cow hides to take back um, to the East Coast. So that is a, a, that is a true story um, that's certainly uh, worth reading. So this is how the Californios um, and the economy here in California was working. Well, there were these folks living to the East called Americans. And they were pushing their way in. You had uh, traders, and you had trappers, and you had hunters. And you had, at this point, by the point we get to about the 1840s, you have a steady stream of settlers coming into the Oregon territories on the Oregon Trail, and people starting to push their way into, um, into California. So a guy called Johann Sutter um, came in um, by ship, and he took Mexican citizenship and was given um, a, a land grant to run a mill near Sacramento, and the Mexicans figured they'd given him Mexican citizenship and maybe he could help them hold off against these, uh, these Americans coming over the Sierra. Well, he welcomed the Americans with open arms and uh, instead just enslaved the local Indians. Um, another guy who was um, really foundational at this period of history was um, an explorer, a provocateur, an adventurer, and an army officer. His name was uh, John C. Fremont. And, uh, and he um, persuaded the US president that, you know, really, we should think about how we can annex California, right? And so he came in with uh, various um, exploring parties ranging up and down the state and, and really trying to provoke the American settlers who were coming in to this idea of, um, of providing a pretext for, uh, for the US to come in and actually claim California. Um, yeah, he's uh, responsible for a lot. Okay. So skirmishes, you know, the Mexican territory, of course, went all the way through Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, quite an expanse. And of course, uh, we end up starting a war. In, um, and in 1846, um, a major battle of that Mexican-American war was actually fought here in San Diego County. Um, so um, uh, the Navy had come in and taken San Diego. Um, but the army um, was coming in um, from the south, uh, along the south of route um, across the desert. General Kearney and the army, army of the West, and they crossed um, through. Uh, they came up through uh, um, uh, the Borrego, um, Borrego Springs um, um, area and came up over the top past Warner Springs and down into San Pascal, where they met the Californios who were riding horses and had lancers. So these American guys had just crossed the desert, you know, wearing those heavy wool uniforms. I mean, can you imagine what that was like? At least it was December. Um, and so they met and fought a battle, and there is actually, um, uh, I actually have never been to the San Pascal um, battlefield, um, but there is a, a battlefield there. Apparently people do stage reenactments. Um, so there was a fight. Both sides claimed victory. Um, <laughs> Uh, Carney's troops moved a little further down to Mule Hill, which is um, not far from Lake Hodges, and there was another battle. Managed to send some scouts down to San Diego where they picked up some of the sailors, marched them up, and finally um, uh, uh, chased the Californios down. Um, at this point, the Americans had, had taken, taken over um, much of Northern California, that now they held San Diego. LA held out a little longer, but eventually would be defeated. Um, and um, ultimately, um, the US government would pay Mexico uh, some money to um, complete the transaction of uh, concluding the war and taking over the Mexican territory. Now just again, during the Battle of San Pascal, December of 1846, up in Northern California, there was this group you may have heard of called the Donner Party. So this is what the timing is, right? So you're fighting the battle of the Mexican-American War down here, and the Donner Party is making some very bad decisions and getting themselves stuck in, um, uh, stuck in the mountains in, in the winter, and essentially um, many of them died, and there was this uh, little problem of cannibalism. It amuses me that there's apparently a Donner Park picnic area. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
All right, so this is interesting. So in 1848, there were about 157,000 people in California, um, and 150,000 of them were um, indigenous Native Americans. So you have you know, maybe 6,500 um, Spanish or Mexican folks and fewer than um, 800 uh, non-indigenous um, um, you know, American folks. And then somebody at Sutter's Mill notices a little sparkle in the water, and it's gold. And so just 20 months later, 100,000 more people have come in. And they're coming in by sea, and they're coming in overland, and they're coming in overland in the routes in the north, and they're coming in overland in the south. This was the only year-round overland um, passage here in San Diego because we don't have heavy snow. And so by the mid-1850s, this is just astonishing, one in every 90 people in the United States was living in California by the mid-1850s. Isn't that just an amazing number? Um, and so uh, there was a fast track to take California, which had been annexed now as a territory, and to actually turn it into a state. So uh, in 1850, um, it became the 31st state in the Union, and it was the only state um, in, the, in the far west. There, were, there, there was the Oregon territories and other territories as well. So you had this huge influx, and that this is the point at which um, parts of my family came in from Europe through San Francisco to go up um, to the gold rush. So I say to people, my family stole this state from the Californios who stole it from the Indians. So. <laughs> um, so what was happening is this massive settlement was, um, was really um, um, annihilation of the indigenous people. Um, so in just 20 years, 80% of California's um, native uh, tribe, tribe folks were, were wiped out. Um, some tribes were eliminated completely. The last speakers of those tribes um, uh, may have died in the, in the teens and 20s. So, so of that original map I showed you, with the kind of kaleidoscope of, um, of different um, tribes, some of those are just completely lost which um, was recognized finally in 2019 with a, with a declaration that California acknowledged that we are built on, this, on the grounds of a genocide. And I think it's really, really important but that, to recognize that the state had bounties on uh, Native American people to kill them. And it is, it is really a, a shameful part of our history that I think we need to remember and recognize. All right, so you have this steady stream of people coming in, you have the gold rush, and as I said, the Southern Emigrant Trail through the San Diego deserts was the only year-round um, land crossing because it didn't come through the, um, the um, uh, it didn't come over the Sierra. Um, and you can actually still see traces of it today because after Carney's folks came in, um, there was a group that came behind them, the sort of construction battalion, the Mormon battalion. The Mormons had been invited to join the army and prove their loyalty to the United States, and they turned out to be really good at building roads. So they helped build um, uh, wagon-competent roads through the desert, um, which became the Southern Immigrant Trail. And this is not one of my photographs, but this is looking into um, Shelter Valley area of the uh, Anza Borrego. S2 is County Road. S2 comes up from Ocotillo Road, uh, Wells. But you can actually still see signs of the uh, Southern Emigrant Trail. And ultimately, it would become the Butterfield Stage uh, Route. And so the stagecoach would come up. And you can basically, if you come up the S2, you're coming up the Butterfield Stage Route. They've rebuilt um, some, a couple of the old stage um, uh, old stagecoach uh, stations, and um, they got up to Warner Springs. And then you could make the choice to turn right and go to Temecula and Los Angeles, or turn left to go to San Diego. And San Diego was the um, uh, sort of side trip, which was an issue. Because here you have this city, it's really only good approach is from the sea because it's got this desert um, um, next to it. And so that actually uh, was a, a problem in constraining um, San Diego's development. If you go to the Vallecito um, stage station, which has been rebuilt, there's a little county park there, um, you'll hear the story of the woman in white. The desert is full of ghosts, and the story goes that, that the stage had stopped there overnight, and a woman died, um, a passenger, a young woman, and when they opened her trunk, there was a wedding dress in it. So she was buried next to the stage site, and they say, you can see her ghost at night. You know, I tell you, if you spend the summer in Borrego Springs, your brain is probably addled by the heat, and you can see a lot of things. <coughs> Um, so, yeah, so, uh, so Warner Springs, you know, you got to turn left to go to San Diego. So by about 1850, Old Town San Diego um, is the settlement. Of course, the Californios had stayed. They were now, um, they were now Americans. 
but um, you still had that strong uh, Mexican heritage. Uh, Old Town San Diego had a problem. It didn't have a good harbor near it. So ships would come in and offload passengers and freight on Point Loma, and then it would have to be brought over by, um, uh, brought, brought over by wagon. Um, this period became very romantic to a lot of Americans, and um, some years later, in 1884, Helen Hunt Jackson wrote a novel called Ramona, a story about an Indian uh, princess, or a, a, an Indian man and a, and a, a, a daughter of uh, one of the Californios. And this became a romantic story that was just so popular for folks. That's how Ramona, our little town of Ramona, got its name. Um, and so there was this whole question about what are we going to do um, we, you know, you can't really develop the city if you have to offload everything in Point Loma. It's about this time also that the Episcopal Church shows up. So now we're finally getting Episcopal Church. We have an army garrison, small army garrison, living here uh, in uh, in San Diego. They actually put the garrison at the mission because they didn't want the bad effects of the soldiers around the folks who were living in Old Town. But an army chaplain in 1853 held the first um, Protestant service in Old Town. He was an Episcopalian, and so 1853. Of course, at the same time, everybody's realizing that San Francisco has exploded. It's now San Francisco and not Yerba Buena. Um, and the Episcopal Church decides, well, there should be a diocese in California, right? So uh, in 1853, they elect um, a bishop. Uh, William Kipp, and he sets out for his new, uh, he's consecrated, he sets out for his new see uh, in, uh, in California, which meant he sailed down from New York to Panama, crossed Panama by wagon, because of course the canal was years away, and then picked up another steamship in Panama to come back up the west coast. Bishop Kipp's ship wrecked in San Diego in 1854. It's called the Golden Gate, and it ran aground off Point Loma. And he waded ashore and was um, uh, taken to Old Town, where um, Don Juan Bandini put him up. And if you've ever been to Old Town, there's the Bandini house, right? So, And this is what Kip wrote about San Diego. A little Spanish town of about a 1,000 inhabitants in a straggling style with a perfectly foreign air mostly constructed of adobes, except that here and there a white painted clapboard shop tells the occupant as one of our countrymen. The town is built around a large plaza where the population, Spaniards and Indians, wrapped in their ample mantles, sun themselves and lounge. How many stereotypes can we fit into that? <laughs> Anyway, so Bishop Kipp will hold his first service in his new diocese here in San Diego, uh, in Old Town, um, and eventually his ship is repaired and he sets, uh, he sets sail up to San Francisco for his, uh, where his sea is. All right, and now we're dealing with this issue of a harborage and so on, and there's several efforts to actually build this, uh, to move the center of the city um, to where it is now. Um, uh, and the first one was called Davis's Folly in, in uh, 1850, failed completely. Um, but this guy, Alonzo Horton, was more successful in figuring out how he could um, basically salt uh, things by giving people money to move uh, with the expectation that it would eventually benefit him. And this led to Horton's new edition of San Diego, or what we now think of as, as San Diego proper, um, and the grid-shaped uh, streets down below. And so as the city has moved from Old Town, the Episcopal Church is going to move. And so uh, the Reverend Sidney Wilbur decides that he will get started with the first church, the first church in Old in Newtown, San Diego, approximate location where the X is on the map, Parish of the Holy Trinity. And I found this great comment in a San Diego Historical Society document, it said, uh, written in 1870, it is clear Mr. Wilbur hoped to be elected as rector and is equally clear the vestry were unwilling to elect him. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know what that was about? So he packs his bags and off he goes, but you still have a parish and you've got several, uh, you've got several folks coming through to act as rector. Um, San Diego is really, uh, 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 um, uh, feast or famine kind of place because you have uh, uh, things expand and then contract. There was a big depression in the 1870s. Um, there are several rectors. The church has moved several times at this point. And then uh, in 1882, a new rector arrives and um, renames the church the Parish of St. Paul and moves it again to build, uh, to build this structure. So he keeps moving it. He moved it a little bit east. And the structure still exists. Anybody know where it is now? 
Yeah, yeah. And, but, it, but it, made, it made kind of a winding trip, right? Because it made, went through uh, the college area first. So they, did, they took this building and actually have moved it. So this is, uh, it's St. Phillips, I think? Fleming Grove. Yeah. Um, in 1896, the Diocese of LA peels off from the Diocese of California. So um, this becomes uh, the fourth oldest pic uh, uh, parish in the Diocese of Los Angeles. Um, and so um, uh, we have this really visionary uh, rector, uh, Henry von Resterick. Resterick, is that how you say it, John? Sure. Yes, sir. Um, and uh, he will become the first bishop of Honolulu. But before he leaves San Diego, St. Paul's becomes the mother of missions because he uses this uh, as, um, uh, and remember, he's, he's downtown. And he, so here, here's St. Paul's, and then the red X's are other church plants that he um, causes to be made all around the county. And um, you can see, I mean, some of these are still extant today, St. James La Jolla, Christ Church Coronado, um, up the street, All Saints. Um, and some of them have moved, but basically the mother of missions. And um, that kind of mission concept, if you go all the way back to Sarah and the Mission de Atala of San Diego with the Franciscans, they also seeded from each mission, they seeded smaller uh, developments. So Santa Isabel up in the mountains, that's actually a mission um, assistancia of the original San Diego de Atala, and they have a little chapel there. So that's how they got, uh, they got founded. So anyway, so this is, uh, the, this is, we're still the Diocese of Los Angeles, of course, and this is um, basically establishing um, the Episcopal presence throughout the county of San Diego. All right, so um, we're starting to outgrow downtown. It's becoming very uh, industrialized around there. Folks have moved uphill to Bankers Hill, and so it's clear that the church wants to move with them. Um, so the Reverend Charles Barnes, um, uh, becomes uh, uh, instrumental in this and says um, and it's clear from the record that at least as early as 1911, 1911, that the rector and vestry were suspecting um, that they could be eventually a division of the Los Angeles Diocese with San Diego becoming the see and the future St. Paul's Church as the cathedral, right? So we're now thinking ahead, we're going to build a cathedral and they will come and make it a diocese, right? Um, so um, the, the vestry and Reverend Barnes hire an architect, Philip Froman. Anybody know, remember who Philip Froman is? National Cathedral, Washington, D.C. He is the architect of the National Cathedral, well known for building in the Gothic style. And so he, uh, he gets together with the vestry and um, is tasked to come up with a plan. They, they've purchased the land up here. Um, I think they turned it into a rectory temporarily. Um, and so they come up with a plan, and he uh, makes a plan that will encompass a large parish house in addition to the cathedral. And so I love this. His first sketches for the complex were done on vacation in Michigan and lost when a zealous chambermaid on a Great Lakes cruise ship threw them out with the newspapers. <laughs> um, anyway, so in March 24, he shows them his, um, his sketches, convinces them that, you know, he'll build, if they build both of them, that he'll, they'll get a discount, so they start building. Um, and this is, I took this picture a couple of weeks ago. This is, this is outside of our, our great hall. That's the, uh, the cornerstone built um, there. Uh, so 1928. Obviously, this photograph is later than 1928 um, based on the automobiles, but that's, that's what it looked like. And of course, what happens in 1929? Depression. All the money goes away, um, and um, the plans are all put on hold. So um, uh, we have a hall, but no church to go with it. All right, so there's a new rector who's going to come in in 1936, but it turns out he has a very colorful past. Um, and I found about, out about this and checked with John that I identified the name when Lisa and I were traveling up and down the 395, and I had a, a book, because I like history, I had a book called The Lore of the 395, and it told the story of this woman named Pancho Barnes who had been married to an Episcopal priest named Rankin Barnes, and I thought, oh my God, I think I've heard that name. And I... Verified with John that I had indeed. So C. Rankin Barnes is Reverend Charles Barnes' son. So like father, like son. He was rector of a, a St. James Church in Pasadena. Now there was a young heiress in San Marino, which is a little town um, kind of enclave of, uh, near Pas in Pasadena, um, and she was a troublemaker. And her parents decided that they really were having trouble with her. So the first thing they did, what do you do with a tr problematic child? 
you send her to boarding school, the Bishop School. It's called the Bishop School because it belonged to the Bishop of Los Angeles, but yes, the, that Bishop School, it was a girls' boarding school. So they send her down there to try to uh, deal with her and then decide at the age of 19 they're going to marry her off to this fine, upstanding Episcopal priest, C. Rankin Barnes. Um, she had been getting into all sorts of mischief, trying to run, do stunt writing for, uh, for the movies and so on. So they marry her off um, to C. Rankin Barnes. Florence Lowe. Well, Florence is not happy being the, uh, being the wife of this um, Pasadena minister. And after a few years and a son, um, she um, runs off with some friends on a banana boat to Mexico. And uh, it turns out the boat is actually running guns. So as soon as they get to Mexico, um, she and her friends um, have to uh, uh, make a run for it. So she's dressed as a man, riding a donkey around Mexico. Um, and basically, they nicknamed her Pancho, which became her nickname for the rest of her life. She liked being Pancho. Um, and eventually makes it back uh, into, into California. Um, but uh, affected, uh, you know, as you can see here, the, the picture of the, with the Serapi and so on. Um, Florence then became really interested in airplanes, and in 1928, um, she uh, becomes a pilot. Um, she's rather annoyed at her husband, who refuses to divorce her, so she takes to buzzing his Pasadena church on Sunday mornings in her aircraft to try to make the point. Um, she flew stunts for films. She was a barnstormer. She broke a speed record um, belonging to Amelia Earhart and was considered actually a pioneering woman of aviation um, uh, who had a huge effect not only as a pilot herself, but as a member of the aviation community. Because uh, there's a picture of her with Amelia Earhart. Because um, she took her inheritance and she bought a ranch near what would then become uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, it was Poncho's Guest Ranch Hotel and Happy Bottom Writing Club. <laughs> and she became um, uh, really um, part of the, uh, the test pilot community, friends with people like Chuck Yeager and so on. So if you watch the movie The Right Stuff, Poncho's in the movie. She was really, really quite important. So here you have a colorized photograph of her with you know, uh, folks standing around the piano at the Happy Bottom Writing Club. Uh, and it would be test pilots and Hollywood types and so on, because of course she'd been flying stunts for Hollywood. Um, however, the uh, Edwards Air Force Base wants to expand. Um, her ranch is in the way. The commandant does not approve of the effect she's having. And there's a mysterious explosion, and um, the buildings will be destroyed and burned down. Um, Concha will have run up through most of her money at this time, and um, uh, uh, ends up, you know, a, a, quite the character. Uh, in, ends up uh, with um, uh, basically died in the 70s in uh, in a small town called Boron on the east side of the Sierra. Um, she will eventually divorce uh, C. Rankin Barnes, or he will divorce her. The divorce papers cite the fact that she had welcomed many men into her bed. <laughs> so apparently they'd actually gotten along reasonably well, but he'd fallen in love and realized um, that he would like to marry again and kissed goodbye his dreams of becoming a bishop because a divorced man was not going to become a bishop. Um, so, and of course he comes to, uh, he, he had come to San Diego and become the rector of St. Paul's Cathedral at that point, and he was, he was rector here for a number of years. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move in, we move into the, uh, we move into the war years. Of course, San Diego explodes with the Navy and the Army. Um, I really like this picture. This is, um, uh, Carmel Valley Road up in Del Mar. I actually used to mm -hmm. live near there. This is the Army marching mm -hmm. by, um, so... Uh, and um, so you had the Army and um, the Navy. Uh, you had, um, out in Borrego Springs, you had this huge um, amount of um, a military there practicing desert stuff. The calcite mine um, was a source for bomb sites. And so you have this huge uh, increase of folks coming to San Diego, who, many of whom will not leave after the end of the war. And so San Diego really explodes in size. And of course, there's no building of a cathedral if you're in the middle of a war. But eventually, eventually the war ends, and Philip Froman, you know, even though we're now 20 years later, Philip Froman is still alive, and he's game to pick up and start up again the idea of building the church. 
and the vestry never has quite a m enough money for this, and there's back and forth, and apparently they get um, a few fights here, here and there because his, his plans have to scale back. But that on the left is what St. Paul's was meant to look at, like, with that enormous spire. I mean, absolutely enormous. And um, also um, a, a huge area pushed back uh, behind um, the chancel. So construction um, is underway. The church ends up um, act, actually using the Great Hall as the, as the worship space for a period of time while all this is done. And ultimately, um, the church is built. And so this is just the same elevation, so you can see the difference. So no spire, of course, and this big extension behind, um, behind the nave doesn't exist. Uh, the chapel and the transept uh, were, uh, by the chapel were added later, but um, they were in the original plan. So, um, who wants a spire? No. I don't think the FAA is going to let us do it. There are still two people who want a spire. No. <laughs> It'll be $20 million, and I'll think about it. <laughs> minimum, minimum 20. <laughs> so these are just some of the historical uh, pictures, um, and thanks to John um, for, for these. You can see when the church is originally built here, um, there's no, the colonnade across uh, the Queen's Courtyard doesn't exist. Um, built in 1951, much uh, different interior, obviously. So here, looking up um, towards the east, um, I like this image because the bishop's chair, the bishop's um, cathedra, is right at the eastern um, eastern side here. Um, there's also um, a photograph I ran into uh, a while back of a of a worship service where everybody's it's got to be about the 19 uh, mid 1950s by the uh, what they're wearing. Everybody's bundled up in hats and coats. So clearly the heat hasn't worked in a long time, right? <laughs> All right. So finally, in 1973, the Episcopal Diocese of San Diego was established. Um, a couple years ago, Lisa and I were visiting my mom in the Bay Area. We went over to the city to go to Grace Cathedral. And as we're walking in, one of the ushers handed us a bulletin. And we said, greetings from the Diocese of San Diego. And he looked at us and he said, that's not a diocese. <laughs> oh, really? It is. We have a bishop and everything. <laughs> I guess San Francisco hasn't gotten over the fact that there's now five dioceses in, uh, in California. Um, but what's really interesting is how long it took the cathedral to become a cathedral because the diocese is established in 1973 and we don't become a cathedral until 1985. So I was asking John about this and I'm sure he'll correct me but apparently there was some conflict over which church should be the cathedral. Yeah, so um, I think La Jolla felt that really the cathedral should be at St. James. And was there anybody else in the running? But obviously, it took some time until we managed uh, managed to actually become the cathedral. Yet remember, it was built. The whole vision in 1919 was that it was going to be a diocese, and this was going to be a cathedral. So uh, it took a while to get there, but we got there indeed at the end. Um, yeah. So that's what I have to tell you about how we got here, who we are, and. Um, the response of the vergers were like, I had no idea California history was so different. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if people have any questions or anything else. In your studies, did you come across the name of John D. Spreckles? Uh, well, Spreckles is a huge name in, in San Diego, of course. Right, yeah. right. Uh, as my understanding was that he was sort of single-handedly responsible for getting it to be Modern city. Uh, uh, well, we have the, we have the Scripps family. We have the Spreckles family. Yeah, we definitely, um, you know, uh, and um, you know, Horton and the Marstons were all, you know, there's a lot of local activity. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, um, um, Jacobs. Sorry. Jacobs. You know, one of his guys. I don't remember. Well, he's a, he's a, the yeah. I mean, he's a modern modern. Um, contributor, but we're, we're talking about the, the older folks. But you know, Ellen Browning Scripps, you know, Ellen Browning Scripps and the Scripps newspaper fame, um, the Scripps Research Institute, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, which of course was founded, I think, in the 1920s, and that's the reason UC San Diego was founded in the 1960s, was because, and put in La Jolla, was because uh, of the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, which is now part of UCSD, not to be confused with the Scripps Research Institute, which isn't. <laughs> Yeah. We knew Kenneth Barnes as his second wife. After he was rector here, he went to work at the National Church. 
in New York City. And when they retired, they came back here. And of course, he, uh, all retired clergy went like this was rested in service. So we always said, I wasn't retired, I was retreaded. <laughs> Richard. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, Mike and then Robert. Scripps Cottage on, on the San Diego State campus was a uh, site of uh, two things that I witnessed. One was Eleanor Roosevelt. And the second was Clement Attlee. Clement Attlee is a former uh, Prime Minister of England. And he was a socialist, God forbid. And he, he is, his uh, uh, mantra was agitate and educate. And that became the masthead of the San Diego Daily Aztec. Uh, what was the last name of the first bishop, Bob? Uh, Walter Storff. Walter Storff, yeah unknown here as Shout and Bob. Uh, when he celebrated the Eucharist, lift up your hearts, they were lifting them up at First Presbyterian down the street as well. He had, he had, he had one of those voices, but yeah, he was instrumental in keeping us, making us the cathedral in many ways. Yeah. Any other comments folks have? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> I'm here because of Rankin Barnes, the son. He introduced my parents to each other in New York City. <laughs> Living history. And I guess I'm just guessing he didn't talk much about Pancho. <laughs> she also claims to have, uh, in her efforts to get her divorce, to have ridden up to the church in Pasadena on a white horse as Lady Godiva. <laughs> but then Pancho told a lot of great tales, so. Any others? Well, thank you for letting me indulge my hobby with you.